You know, when, when we trust in Christ, we are confident that our soul and our eternal destiny, we are entrusting to the one person, Jesus Christ. We're confident because of who he is. He's faithful, he's true, he keeps his promises. That's why we can sing our hope is only Jesus. If you would open your Bibles with me, Romans chapter 7, we're looking at verses 7 through 12. And I'm really excited about this. I love going through the book of Romans. We're going through chapters 6, 7, and 8. And we're now about halfway through chapter 7. And Paul's whole intention in this section is to teach how the gospel applies to our life. How the gospel impacts us as believers, not only so that we are right with God, but what does it look like then to live as a Christian? And he's talked about how we don't live in sin anymore. If you've been, if you become a Christian, you've come to Christ, you're no longer enslaved to sin. You no longer live under the power of sin. You walk in the newness of life, right? You have been crucified with Christ. You've died with Christ. You've been raised with Christ. Sin no longer has dominion over you. And now Paul is getting into the role of the law in our lives, the law of God. The law of God, just a simple definition, is the moral code of the Lord. It's the moral instructions from the Bible to us, what we should do, what we shouldn't do. And in this passage tonight, Paul's going to talk about, okay, we're not under the law anymore, but the law still has a role and a function in our lives, okay? And what I mean by that is we can't be saved by our good works. We know that. We can be saved only through faith in Christ. And so the law can't save us, but the law doesn't just go away. The law still has a role. And Paul's going to answer the question, what is the role of the law in the life of the Christian today? So look with me, Romans 7, beginning in verse 7. He says, what then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had said, you shall not covet. I'm sorry, if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved death to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. It's the word of our Lord. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the truths we've been singing tonight. Thank you for just reminding us that our hope is only Christ, and he is enough. He is more than enough because he's trustworthy, he is faithful, he keeps his promises. Lord, his character is impeccable. Lord, he is without sin, and he has accomplished what no other person has accomplished, and that is our redemption by dying in our place, rising from the dead. He has now been installed at your right hand as the ruler of the entire world to him belongs all authority and power and dominion and we just bow down before king jesus tonight and we now come to your word lord because we believe that through your word you speak to us and so i want to pray you would help me by your spirit to be faithful to your word and to preach with clarity and power and conviction that it would be helpful lord to the men and women here tonight that's my prayer in jesus name amen so everybody loves good news if you have good news for me, something that has happened, something that will happen, that, that's something that makes me happy, right? Everybody loves to hear good news. But what you love to hear even more than good news is good news when you think bad news is coming, right? Let me tell you what I mean. Imagine a father whose, whose son comes home one day and he says, Dad, I made the basketball team. And he says, well, that's great. That's good news. But his dad, he's not thrilled. He's not elated because he never expected his son to get cut. Either his son's a good basketball player or maybe the team doesn't cut or whatever it is. He never thought even once that his son wouldn't make the team. So while it's, yeah, great news that you made the team, he's not elated about it. Change the scenario a little bit. The son goes off to school that day. It's the final day of tryouts that day after school. And the father is anxious all day at work because every year leading up to this year, his son has been cut from the team. And he's nervous because he can't stand the look of disappointment on his son's face when he comes home and says, Dad, I didn't make the team. But this year, his son comes home and says, Dad, guess what? I made the basketball team. Well, this time, 
The father's jumping up and down. He's excited. He's elated because he expected his son to come home and say, I didn't make the team, but now he's come home with good news. Or take this example. A man goes to the doctor, and he's not sick. It's just his annual checkup, and he does all the tests, and the doc leaves the office, comes back. He says, hey, I got good news for you. You don't have cancer. And the guy says, well, that's, that's great, but I never thought I did, right? So while that might be good news, he's probably more confused than anything. But imagine the turn of events when this man actually makes the appointment because he found a lump on his neck. And he goes into the doctor's office and they do a biopsy, or they determine that it's a tumor, and they need to do a biopsy to see if it's cancerous or benign. They take the biopsy, they run the test, and they say, it'll be back in two weeks. How, what do you think that guy's thinking about for two weeks? Nothing but the test, right? He goes back to the doctor's office. The doctor comes in and says, I have good news. You don't have cancer. He jumps up. He hugs the doctor. He's so excited because here's, a, here's what I'm saying to you is that good news is great, but good news is incredible in light of bad news. When we're expecting bad news, good news comes across so much better. And this is important because as Americans especially, it does us no good to hear, at least only hear, that Jesus died for your sins. God loves you. God raised Jesus from the dead. Believe in Jesus and you'll get to go to heaven. Like that's good news, but the average American is going to say, well, that's great, but I already knew God loved me. I'm great. Like, I already knew I was going to heaven. Like, what, who wouldn't go to heaven? You know, only people that don't go to heaven are really bad people. Of course I'm going to heaven. The, the average person is not going to be elated by the good news of the gospel until they hear the bad news. Until they hear that, no, actually, let me tell you before you hear the good news about the law of God. Let me tell you about God's moral code. And, and people need to hear that. People need to hear the standards of God's righteousness and how far they have fallen short of that and the consequences of that sin because that's the only way they're going to see their need for such good news in Christ. Let me just give you an example of what I mean. Think about this for your own life. This is how the law of God works. Have you ever told a lie? Yes, right? The, the law of God says liars spend eternity in the lake of fire. Have you ever been lustful or committed any form of sexual immorality? Most likely, yes. The law says the sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. Have you ever dishonored your parents in any way? Yes. The law says disobedient children should be put to death. On you could go with idolatry and keeping the Sabbath and coveting and murder. But I think you get the point that the law is almost like a mirror that is held up to our face and reveals who we truly are. The law shows us God's standard of holiness and it also reveals to us our wickedness. And when that happens, when you see the perfect law of God in light of who you truly are, then when you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's the best news in the world. That's like the father who expected his son to get cut. That's like the man who thought that he might have cancer. All of a sudden to hear, no, it's actually really good news. When the sinner hears that God is holy, we are sinful. We deserve his judgment. We do not deserve anything good from God. And then when we hear, but God, who is rich in mercy, in his kindness, has made us one with Christ, has made us alive with Christ, is willing to forgive your sins, wipe the slate clean, give you eternal life, reconcile you to himself, bring you into his family, give you the hope of eternal glory. Like that is the best news in the world when you understand what you deserve in light of God's law. And that's what Paul's teaching us tonight. Paul is teaching us the role of the law in the life of the believer. The law is a, an essential component to the gospel. So Romans is all about the gospel. Romans is all about the good news of God in Christ. But up until this point, Paul has talked a great deal about the law. But as he's done so, and this is going to help you understand what he's saying in the text. Just follow me here. As Paul has talked about the law in chapters 1 through 6, he's done so in a very negative way. Let me show you what I mean. Chapter 2, verse 12. You don't have to turn there. You can if you'd like. Paul says this. Chapter 2, verse 12 of Romans. All who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Like, that's not good news, right? That doesn't make me want to love the law. Romans 3, 19 and 20. 
Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Again, that's not good news. That doesn't sound like the law is on my side. Chapter 6, verse 14. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace. So right there he's saying... To be a Christian means you're not under the law anymore. You've actually separated yourself from this, this reality that condemns you. And then last week, Morgan's text, Paul talked about the law a great deal. Look at chapter 7, verse 4. He says, likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, nor that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive. The law held us captive so that we would serve in the new way, the spirit, not in the old way, the written code, which is another way to say the law. So all up until this point in Romans, Paul has spoken very negatively about the law, which then would make his hearers, the original readers of Romans, what do you think they're thinking about the law? Well, Paul, are you saying the law is sin? Are you saying the law of God is bad? Because the way you've been talking about the law, Paul, makes me, makes me think you believe that the law is sinful and it's, it's wicked and it's evil. And that brings you to verse 7. That's why Paul says, what shall we say then? That the law is sin? By no means. Paul knows what they're thinking. He knows the questions in their minds. As they've heard him teach on the law, he knows they're thinking, oh, they're going to think I'm teaching the law is sinful. But let me address that. Is the law sinful? Absolutely not. The law of God is not sinful. It's not bad. In fact, look at verse 12. Paul tells you what he thinks of the law. The law is holy. The commandment is holy and righteous and good. So, okay, the law can't save me, you're telling me, Paul. The law condemns me. I'm not under the law. And yet you're saying the law is good. So what's the purpose of the law then? What role does the law play in the life of the believer? And Paul's going to answer that question in our text, giving us three answers. The first answer he gives us is the law reveals our sin. Look at verse 7 again. What shall we say then? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. So Paul says, listen, the law is not sinful. The moral code, the ethics, the right and the wrong of God is not sinful, obviously, it comes from God himself. In fact, the law is good, and here's a good function of the law, Paul says, the law taught me what sin is. The law taught me what is good and beautiful and true versus what is evil and wicked and false. The law gives us a definition for what sin is. Now to be clear, Paul is not saying without the Bible you can't know right from wrong. He's not saying that. You can know right from wrong to a certain extent without the Bible. That's what's called the conscience. God has given every man, every woman in the world a conscience. A conscience is this moral governor that you have in your mind and in your heart. And that's why you know from the day you were born what's wrong and what's right. That's why you know that marriage is good and murder is wrong. Because your conscience tells you so. Now, your conscience has been has been flawed, is flawed because of sin. It's been affected by sin, which means your conscience has come into a condition where it's not functioning the way that it should. And then the more we sin, the more seared our conscience becomes. But you do have a conscience. So Paul's not saying without the law, you can't know sin. But here's what he is saying. Without the law, you would have no standard of righteousness. You would have no clear definition of what is right, what is wrong, because at the end of the day, most people are going to tell you what they think is right and what's wrong according to their own opinion. If you go around this room and you were to ask each person, you know, what does God accept, what does God condemn, you're going to get different answers because we have different opinions on what is moral and what's immoral. But the law comes in and says, actually, there is a perfect standard for all of this. There is rules across the board. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying that through the law, I have a definition for sin. And that's actually a really good thing because then the law drives you to the gospel. Once you understand the law of God and it reveals your sin, 
it should drive you to Christ. It should show you your need for a savior and the desperate need you have for the forgiveness of sins and it should propel you to the cross where God will forgive you. And Paul gives you an example of what he's talking about. He says, so the law reveals sin. So he says, let me give an example from my own personal life. Look at verse seven. He says, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Paul says, here's what I mean. If I didn't have the law of God, I would not know about the sin of coveting. Now, Paul's not saying he doesn't know the definition of the word coveting. He's not even saying that he didn't know coveting was a sin. This is a man who was thoroughly acquainted with the law of God. He knows this is one of the Ten Commandments. In fact, it's the Tenth Commandment. Paul knows this very well. What he's saying is, I didn't realize how much coveting was in my own heart until I examined the law. I didn't realize how wicked my heart was until God's law was in my face and revealed my sin. And so again, the law is like a mirror that you hold up to your face to see what you actually look like. Because we're like men and women who run around all day with mustard stains and ketchup stains on our face thinking we look beautiful. And then all of a sudden we go to the bathroom and we look in the mirror and we think, oh my gosh, I'm a mess. That's, that's how people are. We, we think we're good. And that's one of the biggest problems with the unconverted, the non-Christian. The non-Christian, for the most part, there are exceptions to this, but for the most part, the non-Christian thinks, I'm a good person. You ask them if they think they're going to heaven, of course. Well, why? Because I'm a good person. Why do you think you're a good person? And then they give you their standard of righteousness. They give you why they think they're a good person. But you ask this person over here, and their standards are completely different. But then you show them the law of God, and we begin to realize, oh, I'm actually not as good as I thought I was. And so I just wonder if you reflect for just a moment, how has God been revealing your sin through his word? What imperfections has God been showing you through his inspired word to encourage you to repent and confess your sins and turn to Christ? Maybe you're like Paul and you struggle with coveting other people's possessions or other people's spouses. Or maybe you stumble over Jesus' words, not to lust over the opposite sex, someone who doesn't belong to you. When God reveals your sin to you, what he's revealing is an opportunity to come to Christ and be saved. And this is why, really practically, guys, this is why your fourth step is so important. Your fourth step inventory is essential to your recovery, whatever your recovery is from. Because when you write down your inventory and you begin to record your past, what you're doing is you're holding a mirror up to your face. You're recording your sins and the sins that have been done to you and all the wickedness of your past. And then you're setting it down next to the Bible and the Bible is condemning that past. And you feel that condemnation when you write that four step out. That's why you burn it afterwards because you don't want anybody to see it. But you know what that should drive you to do? That should drive you to the cross where Jesus' blood will wash away all your sins. Don't let your sins drive you to despair. Let your sins drive you to Jesus. And the law does that because it reveals your sins. The law does something even deeper though. Look at verse 8. The law not only reveals our sin, it says, Paul's going to tell you the law actually agitates our sins. The The law gets us and our sins all riled up. Verse 8, he says, But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. So, Paul, is the law sin? Of course not. The law is good. Here's a good function of the law. It reveals our sin. So, So what's the problem with the law then, Paul? Well, there's no problem with the law. The problem is sinfulness. And he says, let me give you another example. He says, the law, when it told me not to covet, sin came in, seized that opportunity, and produced in me all kinds of covetousness. So the law is not the problem. The law is good. But what happens is when we hear the law, do not covet, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not lie, do not cheat. What happens because we're sinners is sin takes that opportunity of us hearing the law of God and it makes us want to break the law. It makes us want to sin. The law's not doing it. The law's good. 
The problem is not with the law of God. Law of God is perfect. The problem is in our hearts. I mean, if you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. If you tell a little boy not to jump in the pool, what's he going to do? He's jumping in that pool, right? If you tell him not to eat the candy, what's he going to do? He's going to eat the candy. You know, we got, uh, we're watching a little one-year-old at our house that we adore, and I'll tell her not to do something, and that little girl just smiles at me like, I'm going to do it anyway. The law of God makes us want to break it. Our sin causes us to be rebellious. This is true for adults. I mean, if I left you in this room with a box and I said, I'm going to leave for about 30 minutes, do not open that box. Man, everything in you is going to want to open the box. Or if you see a speed limit sign that says 30 miles per hour, what do you want to do? I want to drive 45. Heck with the government, right? Government's wicked anyway. But what that should do when you think about that, that should give you insight into your heart. Like, yeah, I've, I've always had problems with authority, right? We've talked about this. Like, you didn't obey your parents, you didn't obey your school teachers, didn't obey your probation officer, didn't obey the police officer who knocked down your door, you didn't obey the, the judge or the prosecutor or the, you know, the jail officer. Like, on and on it goes. It's all these people in your life, and it's always their fault. They're always the problem. But the problem is actually we hate authority, And the reason we hate authority is because we're born into this world as sinners who hate God. The first man and woman are the prototypes of this example. They are the ones who who had a perfect world to live in and God said, you can do whatever you want. Just don't eat from that tree. What what did that make them want to do? And they were perfect without sin. That made them want to eat from the tree. Because we despise authority. And ultimately it's because we despise God. So... The law is not the problem. The problem is sin, and sin is powerful. Look back at the verse again. Paul says, sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Sin seizes the opportunity when you hear the law of God to cause you to sin more. So it's almost sin makes its base operations at the point of God's law in your heart. And it's not until we hear the law Are we really agitated and desire to sin? Look what Paul says at the end of verse 8. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. So sin lies dead without the law. What's Paul saying? He's not saying sin doesn't exist until the law comes. Because sin existed the moment Adam and Eve disobeyed. The law comes many, many years later. Well, what's he saying? What he's saying is that our sin lies dormant. Almost like a hibernating bear. Until you wake him up and he's ferocious. And so sin almost lies dormant in our hearts until we are told what to do or what not to do. And then all of a sudden our sin awakens. It awakens. I mean, it's like a kid in a room playing with these toys. He's perfectly content. And then you walk in there and say, hey, you having a good time? Yeah, I love these toys. Well, you can't play with that toy. See you later. All of a sudden something wakes up inside of him that says, wait a minute. I'm not listening to him. And the first thing he does is he plays with that very thing you told him not to because your rules just awakened in his heart something that was lying dormant. It's the same with us. God's law comes into our lives and all of a sudden sin just inflames. And so then that brings us to Paul's final point on what the law does and that's the law condemns the sinner. So the law reveals our sin, the law agitates our sin and the law condemns the sinner. Look at verse nine. Paul says, I was once alive apart from the law But when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. Paul says, I thought I was righteous. I thought I was good. I thought I was blameless. But then when I truly realized what the law said and who I truly was, I died. What he means is he realized he was spiritually dead all along. He thought he was alive. He thought he had spiritual life. And then by God's grace, one day his eyes were opened to the spiritual reality of his death. Paul thought the law could save him. Paul thought he was good enough to obey it and keep it and earn eternal life. Verse 10, he says, the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. Paul said, I thought that I was good enough to obey God's law and earn my salvation, but what I actually discovered was the very law that I thought I could keep for eternal life is what condemned me. Technically, if you can keep the law of God, you'll earn salvation. Technically. Technically. I mean, Jesus earned salvation. Jesus earned right standing with God in heaven through his perfect life of obedience. But if Jesus sins one time, 
he is disqualified not only from heaven but from being our savior. You can go to heaven if you obey the law of God perfectly. The, promise, or the problem is, is that no one can do that. In fact, James says, whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point, guilty of the whole thing. So the law promises life, but if you break it, it promises death. And the law, though good, gives sin an opportunity to deceive and even to kill. Look at verse 11. He says, for sin... Seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. Paul says, I thought that the law was a way to life, but what I realized is that sin had deceived me into believing I was good enough to keep it until one day God opened my eyes to the fact that I'm a guilty sinner and deserving his judgment. And here's here's the reality. This is... This is how most people view their lives. This may be how you view your life right now. You might think that you're a good enough person, you don't need Jesus, you know, you're gonna go to heaven because you've been this, that, or the other. But the reality is, is you don't get to decide that. You don't get to decide what is good and what is true and what is evil. God decides that. We don't get to decide if we measure up to God or not. He decides that according to his word. And when his word is revealed, we fall desperately short. I think this is one of the most practical passages in all of Paul's writings. So I just want to give you a few things to take away before we close. Number one, and I mentioned this already, but I want to just elaborate a little bit on it. Here's how you use the law in your life. Use the law like a mirror. Let the law function as a mirror in your life. Again, if you're doing your inventory, you're writing down your past sins, compare that to the law of God. Let the law be like a mirror to reveal who you are. You know, the Bible is the only book that reads you. Every other book we read and we critique the author and we judge its contents, the Bible is the one book in the world that actually sits in judgment of its reader. Because as we read the book, we not only see God's perfect righteousness, we see our sinfulness. And that is good because the law then should drive you to repentance to turn from sin, and to confess your sins. These are really good spiritual things. To acknowledge how far we've fallen short of God's glory and to come to him in desperation and in need of his son, realizing his blood is sufficient and that we have a redeemer who is more than capable of taking away our sins. So use the law as a mirror. Number two, remember that you're no longer a slave to sin. If you're in Christ, then not only are you not underneath the condemnation of the law, you're not underneath the laws or underneath sin's power and attachment to the law. So when we were unconverted, not, we were underneath the wrath of God and our sin held us captive and the weight of the law pressed down upon us every single day, reminding us that we don't meet the standard and that we are breaking God's rules every moment of our lives. But now in Christ, the, the, the law has been lifted. Romans 6.14 says, sin will have no dominion over you since you were not under the law but under grace. Here's what I'm saying. If you're in Christ, you have the ability to obey God. You have the ability to overcome sin. You have the ability to break free from those unhealthy patterns and behaviors that you've been addicted to your entire life. You have the ability to choose righteousness over sin because the Lord has given you a new heart. If you're in Christ, you have a new heart today. So that heart that once desired nothing but just to break God's law now is a new heart and it desires to keep God's law. Not as a way to be right with God. We know we can't be right with God because of the law. That's all through Christ. But now we delight in the law of God. We love God's word, we love God's law, and we want to obey him, and that's because of grace. Add on top of that, if you're a Christian, you have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit who enables you to keep the law. He empowers you for life and for godliness. You can walk in faithfulness. Number three, be aware of your own heart's corruption. Be aware of your own heart's corruption. Paul said in this text that sin did two things. One, sin deceived him into thinking he's a good person, and sin also killed him. Sin, it 
is a powerful force. It's not just right or wrong. Sin is personified in scripture as an individual that wants to do us harm. And it's this indwelling sin and this power in our lives that continually draws us back to this old way of living. And what the law of God does is it helps you to reflect and realize the remnants of sin that are still left in your heart. And when you can realize that, then you can put sin to death. The law reveals that wickedness and Christ by his spirit enables you to put sin to death by his grace. So be on guard against these things. And finally, most importantly, rest in Christ's fulfillment of the law. Rest in Christ's fulfillment of the law. Because at the end of the day, there's absolutely no chance whatsoever that we'll keep the law perfectly in order to be right with God, but there is a Savior who did. You see, Jesus didn't just save us by dying on the cross for our sins. Jesus saved us through his perfect life of obedience. This is why Jesus didn't just come down on a Friday as a grown man from heaven, die on the cross, be raised on Sunday and go back to heaven. This is why he lived 33 years. This is why he lived three decades because in the three decades of life, what was he doing? He was fulfilling the law of God. Every moment of every day, Jesus was obeying his father and achieving righteousness. This is why his baptism, the father looks down at the son and says, this is my beloved son with him, I am well pleased because he is perfectly holy. He is exactly what we should be. He is exactly what Adam should have been. He is righteous and good and he keeps every aspect of God's law. And now the good news of the gospel is that if you trust Christ, Christ is your representative before God. You see right now, if you're not a Christian, you know who your representative before God is? Adam. Adam who fell in the garden. He is your representative and his representation before God brings nothing but condemnation because he brings you into the presence of God on your own merits your own works your own sins you have to put before God your best days and your best days don't measure up to God's standards but in Christ we stand before God with a representative who gives us his righteousness who gives us his perfections so that God looks upon you as if you are Christ That's what a representative does. You're able to stand before God in Christ perfectly holy as if you kept the law just as Jesus did. That's the incredible news of the gospel. That's what should just blow our minds is that this God who is absolutely holy and has every right to cast us out of his presence forever because of our failures invites us to come in, invites us to trust his son and be saved. And so I want to invite you tonight, if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, the most important thing you can do is to trust in Christ, is to turn from your sins. And and what that looks like practically, I'm not going to ask you to walk an aisle or raise your hand or sign a card. You know what that looks like practically? It looks like you bowing your head and in your heart, realizing and acknowledging to the God of heaven that if he gives you what you deserve, you go to hell. If he gives you what you deserve, you deserve and receive wrath. And that there's nothing you can offer him to set aside that judgment, but to receive his son. That's what salvation looks like. That everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So let's, let's pray together. Let's bow our heads and pray. And If you're here tonight and you're a believer, then just rejoice in the work of God in your life and the function of the law in your life as good and holy. If you're here and you're not a Christian, this is the moment to ask God to forgive your sins, to give you a new life, to reconcile you to himself. And so, Father, we come before you, and I just want to pray on behalf of the men and women here. Pray for the believers, Lord. I pray they're encouraged by just the good news of the gospel tonight, that that God, you have satisfied your own justice, you have satisfied your own righteous standards on our behalf in Christ. Knowing, Lord, that we had no ability to do these things, you sent your son who would achieve uh, what was not achievable on our part. And so I just pray we would rejoice in that, pray that we would use the law as a
as a measuring stick to follow the Lord. We'd use the law to reveal our sins, to repent. And God, I want to pray for the men and women here tonight that are not Christians. They're still lost in their sins. Perhaps they think that they can turn their life around by their own efforts and some way please you by the things that they do or don't do anymore. Help them realize how futile that is. Help them realize how much of a waste of time and effort it is to try to impress God with our righteous lives and show them their desperate need for Jesus even in this moment right now. I pray your spirit would open their minds and their hearts and draw them into the presence of the Savior. We ask these things in his name. Amen.